Let me read to you a passage from the 8th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verses 5 to 11. It's the Gospel for Monday of the first week of Advent, year A. And it gives us the prayer of the centurion to Christ. St. Matthew writes, When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion approached him and appealed to him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralysed, suffering dreadfully. He said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion said in reply, Lord, I am not worthy to have you enter under my roof. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man subject to authority, with soldiers subject to me, and I say to one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come here, and he comes, and to my slave, Do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Amen, I say to you, In no one in Israel have I found such faith. I say to you, Many will come from the east and the west, and will recline with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob at the banquet in the kingdom of heaven. That's from Matthew chapter 8 verses 5 to 11. And what does it suggest to us? Well, we find our Lord holding up for emulation by his disciples various figures he comes across. For instance, we remember how he was seated in the temple and he saw a poor unnoticed widow approach the treasury and place in two small coins, whereas the well-off people put in a great deal. Our Lord called his disciples to him and pointed to her, saying that she had put in more than all the others, because she had put in all she had to live on, whereas they had put in what they did not need anyway. On another occasion, he was in the home of Martha and Mary, and Martha was distracted and anxious about the serving. She came to our Lord to complain about her sister, who was spending all her time simply listening to him and not helping her at all. Our Lord gently corrected Martha and held up Martha before her, as an example, her sister in that particular point of time was doing the one thing necessary, which was to give her whole attention to the word of Christ. On another occasion, he was dining in the house of, the, of a Pharisee, and a woman who had a bad reputation came in and wiped his feet with her repentant tears. Our Lord held her up before the Pharisee as an example of love and repentance. The Pharisee compared poorly with her. In his stories, our Lord at times held up surprising persons. There is the story of the Good Samaritan. The priest and the Levite failed badly in charity in the story, while the Samaritan, a foreigner and a heretic, was admirable. Our Lord's questioner, he had posed a question to our Lord to test him, was told to go and do the same himself. Well, in our Gospel passage today, our Lord holds up a pagan as an example of faith. There is no suggestion in, in the text that the Roman centurion adhered to the Jewish religion, even though his very approach to our Lord indicates his sympathy with it. I suppose. But more than anything, what is admirable is the quality of his prayer. It is distinguished by its faith and its humility. He certainly believed that our Lord could do what he was asking of him, and he regarded himself very humbly. He considered himself unworthy of having Christ grace the door of his house. So excellent was the prayer of the centurion that our Lord, the Son of God made man, and the Saviour of the world 
was amazed. He turned and declared that he had not found faith like this in all Israel. Of course, our Lord was expressing his admiration in, the, in these terms so as to praise the centurion's faith and to point to him as an example to the crowd that was following him. It goes without saying that the faith of the centurion could not compare with, say, the faith of Christ's own mother, Mary, of whom Elizabeth had declared that she was blessed for having believed what, what was told her by the Lord. Other examples of magnificent faith could be given, such as Joseph, the foster father of Christ, Simeon and Anna in the temple when our Lord was presented there, and our Lord's own first disciples. But the centurion showed a magnificent faith nevertheless, and that it was so we know on the word of Christ. So just as we learn from the example of the widow in the temple, so too we can learn much from this centurion. Indeed, the church has taken his prayer and uses it every time Mass is celebrated, just before the body and blood of Christ is given to the people at Mass, the priest holds up the Eucharistic Jesus, and together with the entire congregation, he repeats the prayer of the centurion, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Say but the word, and my soul will be healed. A very good practice would be to remember really to mean this when we say it at Mass in union with the priest. Let it become a frequent prayer in our life, that prayer of the centurion. We ought often be asking Christ to come and make us what we should be, healing us of our spiritual infirmities and our sinfulness. That is to say, we ought often be making what we might call spiritual communions, uniting ourselves with the risen and living Jesus, especially the Eucharistic Jesus, who resides constantly in the tabernacle of the Catholic Church. We should invite Christ into our hearts, and a good prayer to do so would be the prayer of the centurion, prayed with real faith and humility. Our Lord tells us elsewhere in the Gospel that we ought to pray always and never lose heart. He has given us the Lord's Prayer as the model and summary of our prayer, and in today's Gospel, we learn from him that faith and humility ought distinguish our entire approach to him. Let us strive to be like the centurion in all our requests of Christ. Christ our Lord will then be well pleased with our prayer. <laughs>